Thank you, guys. Ah, amen. Um, were we able to get a little past that or not? No big deal. Okay, cool. Cool. <laughs> well, there, you know, there's a lot of moving parts that when you're you're sitting, you don't see. And uh, the the uh, internet, the spectrum is not working today. So and. We have we just ran numbers for our, our year again, and some some Sundays we have 50 people or so watch online and stuff. So you guys are absolutely awesome, and uh, and I think that we were able to make the connection online. So you online guys, thank you for your patience. But don't you love all the technology? And <laughs> <laughs> A big amen from Dan, right? <laughs> So, uh, hey, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, grab your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. I don't know why you're doing that. I mean that you, you guys back there, I know the, the team is a little small today and you're making a go of it. So we really, don't you appreciate everything our team does to make it work on Sunday morning? Amen. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I knew I was going to have to, we, we've been in a series of messages and... Uh, uh, actually, I, 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 that sounds like we've been doing this for a long time. We're in our second uh, service. I wasn't here last week, the week before we started our series from 1 Corinthians, cutting through the the noise, a journey through 1 Corinthians. And uh, by noise, you know, we mean all the confusion, all the problems, all the stress, everything that there is. It gets so noisy, right? How do you cut through the noise? And this church in Corinth is a good example, of it, especially when we talk about what Paul teaches them in this epistle, in this letter to the church. This church uh, had multiple issues and problems that Paul had to write to them about and deal with in the church. There were divisions in the church. There was sexual immorality. They had doctrinal, doctrinal divisions, theological divisions and arguments. There was chaos in their worship services and so on and so forth. And so, um, and this letter speaks into that and Paul speaks into that with the gospel of Jesus. That's what makes um, our journey so profound is what he speaks into uh, for them uh, with the good news, the gospel of Jesus. So in the first one, we dealt with this whole problem of, of division in the church. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, the writer of the letter, begins immediately in chapter 1 by pointing out uh, their divisions. Uh, you, you don't have to turn there, but it's in chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. Paul writes and says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels. If you heard that message, you'll remember that uh, I defined find that word as these people had an affection for dispute. They loved the quarrels. They loved arguing together. Um, and so uh, he'd heard that they had quarrels. And he says, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, follow Christ. Uh, I'd almost love to unpack that message this morning. We're not going to. I want to get into what we're, we're, we're dealing with in chapter 11 today. But I pointed out to you in that message that Paul's answer to the petty issues and the division was to make Jesus bigger. Say, make Jesus bigger. Make Jesus bigger. And uh, in particular, I read for you verse 18 of that chapter 1, Paul writes and says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power, the dunamis, the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think I simplified right in that message and said, um, make Jesus bigger enlarge Jesus, it works. So, and, and I kind of was hoping that uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks we've been doing that, I'll get to that in a minute, but I heard this incredible story, and I read this incredible story this week. Uh, I follow articles uh, sometimes on church leaders, and there was one in there this week. You want some good news? I, I know like we pass around bad news, 
even in the church post-pandemic, we'll talk about bad this is and how bad that is. Can I tell you a cool thing that happened at a high school graduation? Well, some good news. Um, it, it received a standing ovation. The title of the article was, After Losing Her Mom, Valedictorian Boldly Delivers Gospel Message in Graduation Speech. Woo. Yeah, and so I, uh, I, I read some of this. Matter of fact, um, let's see here. What did I... <coughs> oh, uh, the article says uh, that this young lady unashamedly made much of her Savior. And I have some of the quotes here that I wanted to, to read for you. This is from her, uh, her speech, right? She says, You are so much more than how well you perform. If you place your identity in what you accomplish and you believe you are only good enough if you succeed, what happens when you fail? What happens when you don't have a lot of money or you don't have a lot of friends? She continued, placing your identity in the things of this world will disappoint you because they are only temporary. Now imagine high school graduation, and we understand a fairly large one, right? She continued on, I had that reality check almost two years ago when my mom passed away. When tragedy struck my life, it was not my grades or my accomplishments that helped me navigate through the loss. When everything else in my life felt uncertain, the only person that I could depend on to stay the same was Jesus. Yeah. I think it was at that point she received a standing ovation. Speaking from my experience, constantly striving to be perfect has never satisfied me, she said. But what does satisfy me is knowing that my worth is not found uh, is not found in my worth and your worth. It is found in Jesus because he's the only one that will ever satisfy us, she told the crowd. Yeah, make Jesus bigger. <laughs> Enlarge Jesus, you know what I mean? I thought about that um, in our connections, our relationships, our family, like we're asking that question in this generation and with all the things we see in the world you know what do we do you know what well I'm going to tell you what a good starting point is make Jesus bigger <laughs> enlarge uh, Jesus and so this week we're going to continue on this uh, we, we still Paul still dealing with divisions in the church by the time we get to uh, chapter 11, matter of fact, it's kind of incredible because the one place where they should have had unity, uh, the Lord's Supper, they had divisions there uh, and, and really, uh, really serious uh, issues. And so I knew we, when we were having communion this Sunday that I was going to jump ahead in the series, right? So we went from chapter 1 to chapter 11. We'll go back next week. But uh, because I knew we were dealing with the Lord's Supper here in, uh, in chapter 11. So let me pick it up, verse 17, and I want to read through, I think it's verse 22 for you. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Man, I would have liked to unpack that. I, you know, I thought to myself as I worked through this text, because we're not going to read it all, but we're, we're doing uh, verses 17 through 34. There's like 10 sermons in here, or, or maybe even more, right? And, uh, and that's so true to our human nature, even in the church, right, that, that our thing becomes about showing that we've got God's approval and that it's more of, uh, from a self-righteous kind of a thing than my personal relationship with God. And this was happening to these people. Verse 20, so then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God? By humiliating those who have nothing, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Sure, certainly not in this matter. So I'm not sure what these people was doing would be called uh, the Lord's Supper. Um, I, and, and 
this, I thought to myself, what would it be like, right? When I was down in North Carolina, one of the things we do, um, often, not always, there's, there's a really nice, mom and dad live on the coast, and uh, there's a really nice seafood buffet restaurant there. Um, any of you like seafood you with me? Oh, man. Yeah, it's like my favorite thing. So, so we'll go to the seafood buffet. You know how both buffets are. I think there's less post-pandemic, right? A lot of them, pandemic was hard on them. But uh, especially when they're crowded, right? It's like everybody trying to get in and get the thing they want, right? And get it first so I get what I want. I want to make sure, you know, it doesn't run out. And I thought to myself, this, this supper sounded more like that kind of an atmosphere than the atmosphere that maybe we're used to with, with the Lord's uh, Supper. Now remember, communion in the early church, they had supper with it. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was at the Passover meal. So there was, and, and we could, I could offer further explanation, the early church had gotten in the habit. I've said that here. I really like that. Matter of fact, um, um, I forget, it wasn't too long ago, we had a small Seder meal to try to create that atmosphere that they would have had in the good love feasts or communion suppers that they would have together because there was a, a larger actual meal um, and then out of that they would take the Lord's Supper together but this had turned into something much different than that the wealthier folks would show up early begin to eat by the time those who had nothing appeared there was nothing left and some of the first attenders were drunk if you read through the text, you'll see that. So you, you begin to, as you understand that, begin to get an idea of why Paul is being so harsh here on these people about their observance of the Lord's uh, uh, suppers. And I thought to myself, you know what happened here? It is that uh, their suppers had gotten bigger, but their Jesus had gotten smaller. Right? <laughs> And that's what I'm saying. Even as I worked through this, I was like, you know what Paul's saying is enlarge Jesus. Even in his response here, he's going to, he's going to be make Jesus bigger. Go to the gospel. Return to it. Matter of fact, in verse uh, 23, he's going to do that. He's going to bring them back to the original uh, context of the Lord's Supper. But, you know, I thought about us. We do this in so much talk. And I tried to come up with a phrase, right? I couldn't do it. I was thinking to myself, I, I think there's an old cliche statement or something that would put it, well, I couldn't find it. But it's where we take the important stuff and we make it unimportant, and we take the unimportant and make it important. <laughs> did, you, did you follow that? I, and I thought we dwell on the petty and neglect the eternal. You know, and it's easy when we, I talk about the law that drift a lot, and when we drift, we tend to drift that direction to the unimportant, to the exclusion of the important, to the petty. Matter of fact, most of us, our minds get fixated on the small. Uh, what is it that they say, it's just coming to me now, like 80% of what you worry about never happens because you're usually concerned about future events. And 80, that, that goes to show you, right, it's kind of like proof in the pudding that we get focused on the small, probably uh, a work uh, of Satan to be able to get us to do that. And these people had been, had the, the church of Corinth had been sucked into that. But once again, the answer becomes pretty simple, right? Make Jesus bigger. <laughs> Enlarge Jesus. It, 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 it works. And uh, there's, there's tough stuff in this text, some really difficult stuff. Initially, when I was working through this, uh, matter of fact, I'm sure Dan and the, the other staff who heard me probably thought I'd be hanging out most on what, take, what happens in verses 29 through 30. Jump, jump over to verses uh, 29 through 30. because um, So Paul gives the whole thing of the, the, the problem, the circumstance, in those verses we read a moment ago. In 23, he's going to recount the original uh, of, of the Lord's Supper, account, uh, account of the Lord's Supper. And then in verse 27, it begins to resolve the problem. And he's going to give the punishment, the potential punishment of what's happened to them. And in uh, verse 29, this is what he says. Everyone ought to examine himself before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body 
of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Listen to this. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. The title I had for the sermon originally, it's still the title now, is Killer Communion. Now you can take that two ways, right? Like you go tell somebody, man, we have killer communion today at church. Like, wow, it was cool. It's like, that's probably not used anymore, right? That, that phrase, it's showing my aim. You could mean that. Or quite literally, it sounds like Paul is saying to them that God is bringing judgment where you are becoming sick and some have died. By the way, I did my research on that little phrase, fallen asleep. And if you have a study Bible and you look in your study Bible for an explanation of that, it's going to be really, really short. Because everywhere that that phrase is used at that time, it meant to die. <laughs> so there is no doubt that, that, the Paul, that Paul meant to them that judgment was coming on them, which kind of... Uh, brings up a whole scary concept and thought. Matter of fact, I wanted to unpack that, right? God's discipline uh, on these people and God's discipline now. So let me do this. Verse 32, I think it's really key to understanding this whole thing that's taking place there. Paul, in verse 32, says to them, nevertheless, which is a good transition word, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. And that should be an amen verse. Because for all the scary in this text, God's discipline, and I've said this so much, there, there's one we need to preach and teach more about. It's clearly in the word. Writer of Hebrews says, God disciplines those whom he loves. loves. So, followers of Jesus, we shouldn't be afraid of that whole thing about God's discipline. And here, the Apostle Paul brings it up too. And it just made me think, God's discipline is always driven by his love. God's goal is is not to destroy us, but to save us. That's what this is, that's what's going on. That's what this is all about. So don't doubt that. Some other time we'll come back and, and unpack that, that whole piece and what was actually uh, taking place here. But um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to unpack a few things uh, 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 just real quick for you before we actually take the Lord's Supper together because we're going to do that as a conclusion to our thoughts here. But so Paul describes the problem in verses 17 through 22. He takes them back to Jesus' Lord's Supper in verses 23 through 26. He describes the punishments and the answer to the problem in 27 through 34. In the midst of that, beginning at 26, I've, there's three things there that I think Paul taught them to avoid bringing judgment on them on themselves and to understand the importance of communion. Just so, just real quick, uh, uh, put these in your thoughts. First of all, verse 26. If you look at that, we didn't actually read that yet. It says, "For whenever you eat and drink this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim." Say the word "proclaim." Oh. Proclaim. The Lord's death until he comes. So the Lord's Supper is proclamation today, everybody. So what in the world, what in the world does that mean, right? Proclamation. And I I love object lessons. Uh, matter of fact, when I can, I like to insert them in sermons. I don't have a lot of them. Some of you haven't seen a lot of them, but if you've been here for a while, you've seen me uh, bring some objects, something. Um, although uh, that object lesson I did for kids one time of a spider in a bag about fear, that didn't work. <laughs> right, Mark? <laughs> if you've never heard that story, ask Mark. <laughs> he, can, he can tell you that one did not work. And it's still coming back in to this day. But uh, the Lord's Supper is the best. You know, I often say, Say, I can never out preach the Bible. I, 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 no matter what, the Lord gives me to come up here and say, The Word of God is the best sermon you will ever read, right? The Lord's Supper is the best object lesson you will ever get. And so it was given to us as an object lesson and an awesome uh, object lesson about the death 
uh, of Jesus and our salvation. The word proclaim actually means to openly celebrate. Okay, so I think we think of uh, proclaiming in different ways, but here in the Greek it means to openly celebrate, to celebrate his death. Who celebrates death, right? I think it's one of the intriguing things about the Word of God and about Christianity that's unique to us. We celebrate a death because it's through the death of Jesus that we get life, right? So, so we're being told here, it's a proclamation about your salvation. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Because of his death, we have life, so we celebrate until he returns. We celebrate his death. And the Lord's Supper is a proclamation to that. Secondly, participation. Uh, verse, verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Of course, this whole text has generated fears and, and uh, various doctrines and stuff about the Lord's Supper. Um, and, and here uh, Paul gives a very clear a warning and explanation about this being unworthy, right? If you drink in an unworthy manner. I think Paul is saying that we participate in communion and don't participate in an unworthy manner. He actually uses the word, if you, if you flip back over since it's close for you, to chapter 10, verse 16. Yeah, the word here translated, I say he uses it, but it's translated into English in many translations in 1016 as the word participation. Listen to what he writes here. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. And is it not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Here's what's cool about that. That word, I know the word. You may not have ever heard it. If you've been around church for a while, you might have. It's used often. The Greek word for participation in this text is koinonia. You ever heard that word? It's used around the church a lot for our fellowship with each other. When we get together, I think it's been used to name fellowship halls. Churches have used it or or ministry groups that fellowship together and they're, they're going to get together and experience koinonia. It's the Christian, the biblical word for the fellowship that we have as believers in Christ. So you can imagine the depth of intentionality here uh, on this word. And koinonia literally means to mingle with, to share in common, or to commune with. I'm pretty sure that it's where we get the word communion for the Lord's Supper. And it comes from Paul here in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, where he uses the word koinonia for our interaction with the Lord's Supper. So we do, it, it, it is the body of Christ in unity, but he's saying we have koinonia with the, the broken body, the shed blood, the elements as we partake them, and with Jesus in his death for us to bring us life. That, that was so cool. I looked at that and it was that word, a, a koinonia, we, we participate. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it, it, it um, makes me more aware. We call communion today a sacrament. Uh, the Wesleyan Church does. It's, it's sacred. It comes from the word sacred. Um, similar word, um, the holiness in uh, the Lord's Supper because we have koinonia and we commune with um, the, the broken body, the shed blood, and all that uh, Jesus has done for us. So, uh, the proclamation, par participation, and lastly, maybe one of the more difficult things to unpack, but in verse 28, <clears throat> Paul says, in, in giving the, in chapter 11, verse 28, and give, remember I said this portion of the text is the problem solving, the punishment, the problem solving. But in verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink 
from the cups. So proclamation, participation, finally examination, uh, and that word means to test, examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see whether a thing be genuine or not. So Paul's encouraging the church people to take a pause. Of course, we, you got an idea of the party they were having ahead of time and the way they were treating each other. And Paul says, Paul, Paul tells them, you need to take a pause and stop and examine yourself and to see whether you're being genuine coming into the koinonia that happens in the Lord's Supper as a follower of, of Jesus. So Paul, you know, Paul, I mentioned that he said it in an unworthy manner. Just a few thoughts here. I think an unworthy manner would be self-righteousness. And what I mean is coming into, that's kind of a, a fearful thing, right? Well, how, oh, am I coming unworthily or whatever? If, if you don't realize your dependence on Jesus as you come into communion, and that it's all about Jesus, then it probably would be in an unworthy manner because then that would involve self-righteousness because we all, we all in a certain way come unworthy, right? Because we all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And it's only through Jesus, right? That's why we, I often say, you don't need to be a member of our church just in a, in a relationship with Jesus, vibrant relationship with Jesus and have received him as Lord and Savior. And then that brings the worthiness, not anything that, uh, that I uh, have done. And so, and then finally, it's clearly implied in this text, and I, I just wanted to take a moment and kind of mention this, because in a second before we take communion, we're going to read the invitation. I read it a lot of times, and I'll get done reading it, and I'm like, did we really pick up on what's said with that? Because I really like it. It's not scripture. It's our statement of invitation to examine ourselves. And we'll read it We'll read it in just a moment. I'm going to have it on the screen for you. But uh, <clears throat> really important to mention here that Paul is speaking into their division too, right? Um, this is supposed to be the meal of Thanksgiving. And he was criticizing um, and explaining to them that their divisions with each other and their interactions with each other was coming to the table in an, an unworthy manner. They were divided on secondary issues. Remember what I said earlier? The unimportant had become important. And, the, and it was all mixed up. And he said, you want to come worthy, that has to be fixed. Your brothers and sisters uh, in Jesus. And the Bible clearly says our relationships with each other is really important to God. Um, matter of fact, the, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, 5 says that we are reconcilers. You know what a reconciler is? That, that verse 518 says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Say, I'm a reconciler. I'm a reconciler. You have a ministry. It's restore. Someone who works with God to restore relationships, right? And Paul's talking to this church and reminding them that they're followers of Jesus together, not, not just uh, individuals individually. You know, and I thought to myself, I love it when we serve together. So, uh, I, and I'll say to the team every once in a while, hey, this event we're going to have, one of the biggest outcomes we get from that is the team serving together. Because when we serve together and we've got a goal, well, no matter what it is, vacation Bible school, a lot of what we do around here, we, in the past we've taken mission trips together, and uh, we kind of drop all the small details to work together on this larger goal, and it's really cool. And the bigger thing starts to matter more than any of the smaller stuff. By the way, missionaries on the mission field, we learn really cool thing because missionaries get on the mission field together from all kinds of different denominations. And one of the things we all knew is on the mission field, there weren't denominations because you were in a unique place and you needed each other. And you dropped all that other stuff to work together. The church on the mission field, I don't know where it is right now, was one of the more unified, um, no divisions among believers that work together on the field, even though they were from different churches. Um, and that's that thing. There was a bigger thing there. So Paul said, let us examine ourselves. Listen, I don't think any of this means that we come to communion as perfect people. We come to communion as forgiven people, 
realizing that it's all about Jesus and it's only because of Jesus that I come to this table and then I experience koinonia and fellowship with God. So I want us to see this invitation. We're going to go into communion now. So if you have your cups, um, grab them. On one side is going to be the bread, the bottom side is going to take And I think everybody's got the same ones today, but in the past had different ones. I think everybody, everybody has the same one. So I'm going to read this invitation I've read so many times. But I'm kind of thinking now, and of course we can spend a lot more time and make it even more meaningful. But now I think for those of you that are watching and listening, it's going to gain a new meaning as you listen to it. And, and I, the, the Wesleyan Church has been in our pastor's manual for as long as I can remember. For decades, okay? So this has kind of been our standard invitation. <clears throat> you who are walking in fellowship with God and are in love and kindness with your neighbors, and you who do truly and sincerely repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God, and walking from now on in his holy ways, come near with faith. Take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to Almighty God. Doesn't that mean something? Now? You know what I mean? For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed to bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to have a word of prayer <clears throat> at the close of it. Um, I will do the Lord's Prayer. Feel free to join in. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you come to you this morning grateful, as always, that your word is your word, that we have it, the power of your word, the truth of your word. <clears throat> and we approach it today, Father. And, and I'm, a, I'm certain, Father, looking at the context of this situation, that those that are here today, those that are watching online, have, will take this moment to examine ourselves and we come to this, this, this koinonia. And Father, we, we still lack understanding of that completely. But we know you desire a relationship with us. And out of that, you sent your son, Jesus. And Father, this is your gift to us when we receive it through your son, Jesus Christ. For it is by faith that we are saved and not through works. So none of us can boast. So, Father, we come in the humility and the knowledge uh, that this is all about Jesus. It's all because of Jesus that you have loved us and reached out to us in relationship. So, Father, as we examine ourselves today, we come before you. We think about our relationship with you. We think about our relationship to others. Father, forgive us for our sins and wrongs in these areas. Give us strength. And then, Father, we, we come to this moment. Um, as worthy participants because of the shed blood, broken body of Jesus to remember and to proclaim his death today. So, Father, bless the cup, the bread, those that are online, the digital watching this morning, the elements that they have, Father, before them, <clears throat> ours in house here. And then, Father, we're grateful that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So in house here, take that that bottom portion, open it up to the wafer, the cracker, the bread, whatever's in there. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat 
And with thanksgiving in your heart, be grateful to God for what he's done for us in Jesus. Let's partake together. Take the other side of the cup where the grape juice is. Pull that back. Scriptures say without the shedding of blood, there cannot be the forgiveness of sin. I never say that with no. Just, just explaining that the most precious thing in the world is blood. Without it, there is no life. So it's a fit symbol and example today as we fellowship with God to our salvation. And Jesus' blood was perfect and spotless. And so it was the only blood that could bring us salvation. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was given for you. And let's be grateful in our hearts. Let's partake together. Father, we thank you for Koinonia, for these moments together. Bless each and every, every one, Father, that uh, as we participate in this Thanksgiving meal, this communion with you, Father, um, in that fellowship, it lives in us, and we go to share it with others. And we're grateful this day for who you say, for who you say we are, in Jesus' name. Amen.
been in the presence of the Almighty God. We have communed with Him through the elements, and now as we leave this place, may we continue to commune with Him as His children in a relationship like no other that we ever will experience. Have a great day.